If you're watching this video, then like me, you are probably a hardcore fan freak. It's a great thing to be, isn't it? Some people like listening to content and I'm certainly one of them, but at the same time, I really like searchable content. So the breakdowns I've been doing of the Wheel of Time show versus the books include a whole set of text blogs, but then I'm also recording them so that you can listen to them if that's your preference. I'm also looking to convert them into podcast format as well because, you know, that's just kind of the OCD kind of thing that I do. But I'm trying to make the content accessible to everyone in their favoured format. It's pretty hilarious when I look back and think that when I first started doing this, I sort of thought one hour episodes on the TV show, you know, probably it would be like an hour and a half or something breakdown when I combine all the blog posts together. But I am now on my third recording for episode one alone. And it's going to be interesting to see how long this recording turns out to be. Have a look at the timestamp and give yourself a bit of a giggle because I don't know at this point while I'm recording, but you'll be viewing this, of course, or listening to it after it's complete, so you'll know. Righto, let's get into it and see how far I get. A mountainside view. Egwene knows Rand well enough to know his favourite brooding, uh, I mean, thinking spot. As soon as Tam told her he left early, she knew where he'd gone. I will admit, it wasn't until my second or third rewatch that I remembered a certain scene with Rand brooding alone on the side of a mountain. It's in Chapter 2 of The Dragon Reborn. I wonder if we'll get this scene. Then I wonder, if we do, will it be a beautiful callback to this moment? The only similarity may seem to be Rand on a mountainside, but we learn here that when Rand is worried about things, he likes to sit alone and think. When Egwene attempts to talk a little deeper about her side of things, he just says, I know, I already know. Thus, he shuts the conversation down. Sound familiar? While we did not see this scene in the book as such, we quickly learn something of Rand as a young person with hopes and dreams. This is presented early in the books when Rand finds out Egwene has her hair braided. In the books, for a change, it is all part of one scene. He learns both she has braided her hair and is considering becoming wisdom. They're standing in public and he responds in a similar way to what we saw the night before. In the book, it's Egwene who says that a wisdom almost never marries. Notice it is almost never, not that she absolutely cannot. I wonder if it's because a wisdom who can truly listen to the wind can channel. This means she could live hundreds of years like the kin. Maybe some wisdom that cannot and are aging normally do marry. That could be a possibility. Anyway, we learn the same things in the book as in the show. Rand has spent his short life daydreaming of marrying probably Egwene and raising children here where he feels happy and safe. This, of course, becomes the focus of his confrontation with Ishi in episode 8. It carries more weight for me as what he sees there truly mirrors what we learned here in a couple of quick scenes. Beautiful bookending of episodes. What we learn in both the books and the show is that there is a deep connection between Rand and Egwene. 
Rand has only ever dreamt of a quiet family life, but Egwene has dreams of becoming something more and has had them for a long time. She feels that she can make goals and go for them. Women's Business Moraine takes the opportunity to talk alone with Nynaeve. Nynaeve is cleaning the sacred pool in the cave. We only know why she's cleaning it because we saw the paint ceremony in the trailer. The actual scene was cut between the trailer and the episode completion. Or did they leave it in the trailer so that we would know why the pool needed cleaning? It's kind of funny because many book readers spend a lot of their time examining a scene to discuss the differences to the book. And as a result, they find the differences piling up quickly. However, I like to examine the scene for what important story or character information or plot it contains. Then I like to find how we learned that in the book. And when these line up, I get that wonderful aha moment. And that is what I really enjoy to unfold here most of all. In the book, there is no cave. There was no ceremony involving pools, paints or rivers. Certainly no cliff yeeting. Thankfully, the braiding of hair was something we could grab hold tightly and say, yes, that feels right. Then give it a little tug for good measure. I titled this post Women's Business because we know that term so well. We don't actually hear it as a term in the show, yet we clearly see the ceremony happen. We learn that men are not included in fact, men don't even get told any details later. In the books, the term women's business is frequently used to tell men to butt out. Where did you come from? Now Moraine approaches Nynaeve to do a little family tree digging. In the books, Moraine says that she is a student of history. She uses this as a reason for asking lots of questions regarding the age of the youth, the lineage and birthplaces. Without a doubt, she knows she's looking for a young man. In the show, Moraine is looking for anyone in the age group so far as gender. However, she knows the dragon was born on the slopes of Dragon Mount. This makes sense in light of this conversation. Moraine is specifically checking on Nynaeve and her history. We don't know if she's aware Nynaeve can channel. We are aware that she wonders if Nynaeve is a candidate. And for this reason, she tries to get Nynaeve to talk about the details of her birth and arrival in the two rivers. Nynaeve deftly deflects the conversation to what she would rather bitch about. In the book, we know Moraine was asking lots of questions because the boys talk about it. That's not very interesting in a show. We want to see things. How gorgeous is it to see the cave this way first? Nynaeve is carrying out her tasks alone. Moraine questions, but she is kind of tactful. She praises Nynaeve and disputes the things said about her abilities. I found that a wonderful line. We simply did not have enough time to meet Coplins, Congas and Senbui. It's effective to use repetition for emphasis in books. In a show, repeat beats are redundant. So instead of all that repetition, Moraine disputes the statement. This gives us the clue that she has been talking to others in the village. Done deal. Distrusting Aes Sedai. Lastly, she doesn't disagree with Nynaeve's account of the trauma Doral suffered by being rejected at the White Tower. I loved how she simply accepted 
that this is Nynaeve's belief and understanding. Can you imagine the argument had she said, oh, that's a bucket of fish guts. The white towel doesn't do that. Instead, Moraine turns that huge complaint around to compliment Nynaeve on the point she is most sore about at home. In the books, Nynaeve is more generally suspicious of Moraine because she's a stranger. Her real distrust of her, and by extension all Aes Sedai, starts when her village youths are taken. However, we know that distrust of Aes Sedai is the most common sentiment in the village. In the books, Moraine gets off on that bad foot by calling Nynaeve child. As soon as she found out, she apologised. So, we know that Moraine has nothing against Nynaeve from the start and tries to keep things polite. We also know polite and Nynaeve don't actually go together. Basically, you could say that in answer to Moraine, Nynaeve says, none your women's business. Cheers. We received three quick scenes in succession. This first one is another glimpse at the relationship between Rand, Matt and Perrin. The emphasis this time is on how well Matt knows Rand. The previous night, Perrin and Rand briefly discussed Egwene. We saw their close relationship. We also saw that Perrin is genuinely interested in how Egwene was. This time, we see Matt's friendship with Rand. Once again, we get some great character depictions and facial acting. I love how they use a lot of facial acting and body language to help give us internal responses and feelings from our characters. In the books, we see inside the heads of the characters quite often, and it's really difficult to convey this on screen or adapt it to the screen unless you have exceptional actors. In the books, we often view Matt as being lazy, immature, tactless, roguish, and brazen. He certainly approaches Rand in a rather tactless and brazen manner, all right, out with it. I laughed on my first watching and still do when he delivers that line. It's just, well, so Matt. The thing is though, Matt is not stupid and he takes notice of everyone around him. I could probably do quite a long video on how misunderstood Matt is in the books by all the other characters. Certainly, everyone in the Two Rivers have clearly labelled him. I can't wait to watch his character development in the show. They've nailed so much of his true character with the writing. Of course, Barney has portrayed Matt with skill. However, I have no doubt that Donal will continue and show even more depth as Matt's arc moves along in Season 2. Matt doesn't just ask Ran how Egwene went the previous day. He takes one look at Rand as he puts the mugs on the table and knows something is very wrong. I also love how Perrin is like, what? Light love you, Perrin. Again, I laughed at the way this nailed something we know about Perrin. He likes to think things through. Matt jumps from, what a year shite, to, out with it. Perrin will catch up, of course. I can hear him thinking that he was just enjoying some morning ale, and now it's complicated. Finally, Ran doesn't even answer Matt. It's easy for us to know that Matt nailed it since we saw how it all went, but Ran's look, is chef's kiss. Listen to the wind. The second of the three very short scenes. Don't let a short scene fool you that it's not important. 
Here is another gorgeous example of show, not tell. No words at all. The scene opens with Egwene alone shedding a tear. Why? Evidently, she is grieving the loss of her relationship with Rand as she prepares for a new path. Egwene did not really show Rand that she feels a personal loss. When with him, she acknowledges his loss. Now, privately, she's in touch with what her choice means. A few scenes back, we heard that Nynaeve thinks Egwene can listen to the wind. I talked about that in a previous post called Egwene for Wisdom. That was an example of telling. Now we get a superb showing. In the books, Nynaeve often mutters to herself about feeling like there's a big storm coming. That worked really well in the books. But for a show, we want to feel like we feel it too. I love the use of the camera to bring us over to stand beside Egwene and experience that eerie set of sounds as the wind blows. There's just enough low level sound to the whispering feeling to make it creepy. Yet it still feels almost like hearing wind. All we need is this quick moment with them and we know something is very wrong. We previously learned that land detected the presence of the fade and we saw the fade ourselves. The book used long descriptions and scenes that give us detailed information. However, the show uses very clever short scenes that begin to build a connection of facts that we can put together ourselves. Slowly, we're learning all the facts the books give us about how certain things in the world works. While they're presented differently, the presentation suits the different mediums. We also receive confirmation that at this point, Nynaeve can hear it too. We will certainly pick that up later. In The Gathering Storm, Nynaeve hears the wind turning from a whisper to a shout. Remember that when we get to episode eight. What they hear on the bridge here is on the level of a whisper. Dragon's Fang. This is the third of these three quick scenes and this scene is very dark and gives the viewer a heightened sense of foreboding. Really, that foreboding built up in three steps, starting with Matt saying, come on, spill it. Egwene hearing the whispering sounds on the wind and now Lan finding this horrible scene. We know it's nothing to do with the books. Obviously, sheep have been killed by Trollocs and we know that Trollocs don't do this. Not the way we see it on the screen. Oh sure, they would disembowel a lot of sheep. But it comes back around to the whole concept of show, not tell. Dragon's Fang on the indoor. In the books, we hear of the dragon's fang being drawn on the door of the inn. We don't even understand what it looks like at that point, but we do know it's bad. Through the experience of Bran, we learn it's a way to accuse somebody of being a dark friend. As the book series progresses, we learn a lot more about this symbol. I truly feel it would have meant little to viewers to see that complex scene at the inn door. We don't have time as we're going to get out of the village by the end of episode one. Yet, introducing the symbol is smart. Have you ever noticed how much symbolism we see in the TV series? Oh, I would love to just do an entire video just looking at circles representing the wheel and the dragon's fangs that show up. Dragon's fang in dead sheep. So back to this scene though, my recollection of the book is that the winter has been particularly hard. There are reports of wolves and bears coming down from the mountains and killing. I remember just taking that at face value for a long time. 
As usual, RJ gives us a lot of information in the book. Wolves are raiding sheep pens. Well, that sounds plausible. Chewing their way into barns to take horse and cattle. Uh, that sounds rather astounding, even for a bear. Watch a trollic smash a door, however, and suddenly the barn scenarios make sense. Men are the prey as often as the sheep. By now, they are thinking that bears are also attacking. Later on, we learn that this was trollic activity. Beautiful and subtle. However, in a show where we need to get moving, this scene packs in so much. It is unmistakable that this sheep attack is unusual. The viewer will not think for even a moment that they were killed by wolves or bears. While the viewer won't know on the first watch what killed them, all their senses are on alert. Lan doesn't even have to say anything. His facial acting, slow movements and the camera panning out does it all. I fully understand that this would have been bizarre behaviour for Trollocs. Even though this is fantasy, we know Trollocs would not deliberately do this. It's just as unlikely that a Fade would make them do this. But hey, it's TV and the symbolism is quite subtle for someone who doesn't know this symbol yet. We saw a glimpse of this in the trailer and had already nailed the symbolism as fans. Viewers that have not read the books will find this symbolism delicious to put together as the story progresses. I think the scene works effectively. For this reason, I'm happy to just revel in the pure visual display. Watching it with my friend Kathy was a joy when she started picking up on the symbolism. And I think that is what it was meant to be all about. Eavesdropping. I'm going to address these few seconds that open and close the scene separately. I believe Moraine is using the one power to eavesdrop on the conversation between Rand, Matt and Perrin below. We already know she can do this. More than that, we know she does it in the eye of the world as she's trying to figure out who the dragon is. However, in the book, she uses her Key Sierra as a focal point. We do see her Key Sierra later when she's in the White Tower. We even see her use a blue stone as she tests to see if a Gwen can channel by focusing through it. But we cannot see it here. I believe there is a simple, even a good reason. Okay, you be the judge. The use of the Key Sierra is limited to Moraine only. When we consider the size of the series in book form, it's a great little item. It helps us learn a few things about Wilders. Moraine also uses it to keep reinforcing that things don't have a power of their own. According to Harriet in an interview that I found on Theoryland, and there's a link to it on the blog, the Key Sierra has a rather different history than I ever realised and I love it. This gives a connection of the Key Sierra to another Arthurian tale. At the same time, it connects to the early Conan work that RJ did. Ha! Oh, delightful! I did always feel that her use of the Key Sierra in the books was just a tiny bit out of place. Now I see it snap perfectly, like that puzzle piece you were trying to put into the sky instead of the water. In the show, I feel that the eavesdropping was supposed to be subtle. Remember, Rand already told Perrin to talk quietly because who knows what she can hear. I think that for the show to tie her ability to the stone it's not really appropriate. If we see this early, we'll expect to see the same or similar later. So just like they didn't bother giving Moraine a staff at all, they're best not to eavesdrop with the Key Sierra. 
Moraine still has it, giving a nod to its history and fans, and she still uses it to channel into and light it up with a Egwene. I'm perfectly okay if she just doesn't need it to eavesdrop. Will it be more powerful for new viewers to simply discover she can hear things from a distance? Then it becomes a fun thing to realise again on a rewatch. After all, in the books, Egwene and many Aes Sedai do this frequently without a stone lighting up or glinting strangely. That's what friends are for. One does find themselves wondering how many times Rand and Perrin have helped Matt out. They know each other well enough to realise he needed money to buy lanterns for his sisters. They didn't know him well enough to realise he would have solved it himself. Maybe, maybe they knew he would solve it, but wanted to make sure and offer the money. I liked how Perrin refused to take no. I also felt it really looks like very little money. The coins looked like coppers. I've watched this scene and I've imagined those silver coins Moraine gives the boys in the books. If we'd seen them, the difference between them and these coins would be striking. This made me feel really deeply for Matt. His family situation is so dire he has to go to extremes just for a few flimsy coins. As I've stated in many other articles, I'm not really concerned with the details that have been changed. This scene didn't happen in the books. Matt's not in the same family situation in the books. What does interest me here is the character trait establishing that we get to see. The night before, when Matt lost that last toss, I could feel his despair. He was trying to seem nonchalant. I felt it showed the deeper things we know about Matt well. Throughout the book, Matt is constantly misunderstood, underestimated and even slighted by other characters. I know I've said this before. Now, I feel that this is partly because he deliberately portrays himself as uncaring, unthinking, and even underhanded. It always fascinates me to be inside his head as a reader. So, what did we learn about each of the characters here then? Matt. He's not always lucky when gambling, even with dice. Nice setup, as we'll see that change. I like how loyal he is to his family. Well, his sisters are his heart. Yet he looks after his mother, despite her reactions. He's embarrassed that even his best friends realize that it will be hard to buy those lanterns. He's quietly, but genuinely grateful for their help. But he doesn't tell them he got the money another way. I kind of felt really sad for him at that moment. Perrin, we see his lovely nature as he just gives that little look at Matt and pushes the coins back without a word. Perrin is a good friend. He doesn't always say a lot, but he sees what's going on. Rand. Rand was obviously in discussions on the situation with Perrin and just as keen to help Matt out. It looked like he was not going to leave the village for home unless he knew Matt would have his lanterns. Again, this is not a scene from the book, but was a fast way of establishing how close the boys are. And yet, they don't all know everything. Matt comes across as not so mature as Rand and Perrin because they have to give him money. The reasoning here is not the same, but Matt in the book seems as though he is growing up slower or more reluctantly. The situation gives some similar character traits to Matt, but in a way that suits the age group a little better. I think so anyway. Winter night or bell time? 
I'm not actually going to tackle the attack of the Cholix in this particular post. There's a couple of things I want to get straight or make more mixed up maybe. Whichever I end up managing, it's important before we move into the format that I've chosen to examine this huge attack sequence. Firstly, I've read many hot debates in so many places on the topic of winter night versus bell time. Yep, I've read a bunch. I've heard it debated in videos and podcasts. And frankly, I don't give a living damn. I will still end up reading more, I'm sure. That's just the kind of nerds we are after all. When the show first came out, I did get down that rabbit hole. It was fun for a while. However, with some time and much pondering, I see many of the changes differently now. You already know that if you've been reading and listening to others of my posts here. So let's face something that you may not have given a lot of thought to. Bell time is not an important feature of the Wheel of Time as a whole. It's truly not. Okay, I've said it out loud. Consider that we only ever hear of it in Eye of the World. It does not impact the character arcs nor the entire story plot. So, if they change the calendar a little and the purpose of the festival a little, does it actually matter? Oh, I know from a book purist way maybe it does. But once again, we are getting a lot of information across in a completely new medium. What do we actually need to know about bell time? What moves the characters and the story plot forwards? Let's see if I can get the important points. Egwene comes of age. Yep, this happens. Differently, I know. But her hair is braided, which honestly could have been dropped. Now don't yell at me. I'm glad it didn't. Egwene is recognised in the women's circle. As a result, she goes through a ritual and agrees to become apprentice to Nynaeve. She can listen to the wind, we know this means that she's wilder. Subsequently, Rand is devastated that she's not going to follow the dream he presumed would play out. There's a festival and strangers arriving. The world accepts that reincarnation is real and the wheel of time turns through the ages. Trollocs attack. This results in death and devastation. Moraine and Lan are the main fighting force that saves the village. Ran discovers his father has a sword and can use it. He also discovers he is not his father. His father is seriously wounded with trollic poison. Moraine heals him. I took all of that stuff out of the book and hey, all those things happen. So, if the details of bell time and when the bits happen change, it's just no biggie for me. We get all the important stuff and the visuals are burned into our brains. I have said that this will be a scene by scene breakdown of the show. However, in reality, to cover this attack, I feel I'll do it more justice by now taking us through this night by the character plot. In the show, the POV, it just jumps wildly all around the village and out to the farm and back again. And this works perfectly in the show. But to break down all of this with any clarity, I, I want to flow each story thread through until the scene when Moraine tells them that they're all leaving with her. <sighs> Are you ready? Well then, buckle up. 
it is going to be quite a ride. We'll start with Rand because I'm going to basically break this down starting with the first character that we see and then the next one etc but doing their thread. Homecoming. Rand and Tam arrive home at their farm in the Westwood. We can immediately see that the sheep are okay from the aerial point of view. In the books, Tam is already on high alert. Rand is on alert, but thinks that Tam has things under control. In the show, they simply arrive home. We know as viewers that things are going to go wrong, so we are already on alert. Rand feels a little apprehensive that they're not at the village tonight to light their candle. This suggests to me that they normally would have stayed in for this night as well. Maybe Tam was feeling uneasy at a nice that I being in town. Whatever the reason, it's a good opportunity to begin the explanation of reincarnation and how the Wheel of Time works. In truth, I feel that Tam is already on high alert because there's an Aes Sedai in town and he just knows instinctively that there's something going on. I like that we learn this through a discussion rather than through some recitation of things that they're all taught. Rand is able to ask questions and best dad Tam simply answers. This gave me the feeling that they've always had a good close relationship. It's not a part of any book law concerning the Wheel of Time that you can do something to guide the spirit of a loved one back to you. I think it gives a nice visual. And this visual probably helps people remember the concepts. Again, I, I don't think it's a important movement from the law of how the Wheel of Time works in the books so far as it doesn't change anything about the entire story arc. Lighting the lantern. I love the bell on the poles where Rand and Tam are about to hang the lantern. When I farmed a small dairy of goats, I would call them home of an evening. This is what that bell is for. For me, I could cut my hands to my mouth and call, come on, come on. And the goats could hear that from a long way. There would be an answering few tones of, Aah. and then you'd see movement. Down the hills, Leaping, skipping and bounding in mad abandon, the herd would race home to me. Anyway, I digress. Um, maybe. I mean, that bell is used in the same way to call the sheep home. Now they're hanging the lantern to call Kari's spirit home on that same pole. I like this a lot and it struck me from my second time watching. The first time I was just trying to get my head around the change in the meaning of bell time. Honestly, did we need nubile girls dancing around a maypole to signify that they're ready for men to pluck like pretty flowers? Nope. I actually jumped up and yelled out when I saw the next thing happen. What the ever-loving blood and ashes is Tam doing with flame sticks this early in the story? I'm putting Tam's iconic monologue into a post of its own. Now, the first warning of trouble. Bella warns that something is very wrong. Rand and Tam are back inside preparing dinner when she calls the alarm. That's our Bella. Talk about great use of body acting. Bella is obviously pacing in a way that's unusual. As a result, Tam and Rand look up and their expressions tell us that they're on alert. They don't race out or take any actions that indicate great concern. 
but then the door bursts in. That is more than just a little unusual. Dad, what is that? Answer, Rand, run. <laughs> Funny, I always thought they were trollocs. Who knew they were run? The fight that ensues is not the same as the one we've read so many times. I know, we were all waiting for Narg to talk. Narg is really just something of a fun fandom joke. Lan is surprised when Rand tells him, but since we never hear another Trolloc talk, not ever, there is no reason to have one talk in episode one and then not repeat it. So let's, let's just move on. The more I've watched the second half of this episode, the more I have liked all the stuff we got to learn. It's far more graphic than our read of the night is because we only saw this one attack. Then we arrive at the village and see the results of the rest of the attacks. So I want to pretty much ignore the gore and horror element and note what we actually learned. Firstly, we learned Trollocs are real. Okay, like pretty obvious, but this was a big deal to Rand as we went through the ordeal from inside his head. This is his thought, but Trollocs are, are just... Rand let the words trail off. Not just a story. Not after tonight. Tam has a sword with a heron mark. Tam keeps the sword in a chest. Rand has never seen it before. Tam grabs the sword out and obviously knows how to use it as he fights with the Trolloc. He is willing to stay and die alone fighting if Rand would only just leave and run for his life. Tam is injured by a filthy Trolloc weapon. Even though we only have one Trolloc, Tam is injured and Rand gets to engage in a little fighting. He even manages a kill. The wound immediately begins to go black and swells in a red mess. Rand gets Tam back to the village. It takes all night, just like in the book. Okay, he has Bella, which is a great help. But honestly, did we need him to drag Tam? I know, lots of us were left wondering what kind of a fish stew made with only the heads was the idea of not showing the fever dreams. Since this is not a first reaction post and it is full spoilers, we know that did happen. The information was simply given to us in a different order and I loved that it made the reveal of the fever dreams way more exciting then reading Rand go on and on to himself about how Tam is his father. Moraine heals Tam. Since we don't have Nynaeve there, we can simply let Egwene triage and Moraine heal. It's impactful to see Moraine heal him in the middle of the destruction. We don't need to be told how much Moraine has done and how tired she is. We've seen what she did. We saw her collapse at the end of it. Now we can see the wounded strewn around and finally we see her hand shake as she does the healing. I can't think of a single point that the show needed to make that it didn't. Sure, it's been changed up, but we hit all the beats. As a result of those successful beats, viewers are ready to be told we got to go. Tam's monologue. How delicious was the delivery of this? It begins with Rand asking his dad to explain the world to him. How long does it take before the wheel of time turns someone's spirit back into the world again? There's not a lot of telling in the show in general, but when it happens, you have to take careful note of the visual clues they give us along with it. 
because these are as important as the words we're hearing, at least as important. Tam replies, wish I knew, but I'm sure there's a reason no one can remember their previous lives. So the first line of the response is quite straightforward and then the feast begins. Tam says, all we can do is the best we can with the life that's given to us. And we see Tam lighting a match, lighting the lantern and blowing out the match. Uh, I mean, flame stick, as he explains this. I think it's fair that we can say Aludra did the best she could. Next, Tam says, and take comfort from it, that no matter what happens, what pain we face. I'm sure you agree that this has to be a foreshadowing of Egwene's arc because as Tam says this, we see Egwene with a tear in her eye, putting the lanterns onto the water. What pain we face. Oh, my heart leapt into my throat, thinking of next season, just for starters. Tam continues, what heartbreak. We get this absolutely soulful puppy dog eyes close up of Rand's face. How many types of heartbreak does Rand suffer? So much that he believes the only way to cope is to become ever harder. That innocent face we see as we hear those words and he just can't comprehend any of that. Pain, heartbreak, and death. Oh, blood and bloody ashes, it's all to come. And when Tam says, even death, we flick to seeing Matt's face. This was a moment I knew we really have to pay a lot of attention to fast switches in scenes during a monologue in the show. Even death, Matt nailed it. Next Tam says, the wheel keeps turning, always, and we try again. Maybe do a little better than the last time. And the scene we get is Matt putting the lanterns into the water with his two sisters, with Natty and Abel standing above him, watching what's going on. Maybe they'll do a little better next time. God, we hope so. They can't do much worse than what they're doing now. So does that mean that there is no redemption arc this turning for Natty and Abel? Or does it mean that we will actually see later on them sort their shit out. <sighs> That's what WAFO is absolutely going to be all about for us watching this show. Moving on to Egwene, we start with the Beltine lanterns as Egwene puts her lantern into the water. So it seems that everyone in the Two Rivers has someone to think of at Beltine, and that makes sense because life and death are inevitable. So everyone has lost someone. But I noticed that Egwene was doing her Latin ritual alone. I am not sure why she's not with her family doing that. But who doesn't love a good dance, hey? The first we see of Egwene after the lanterns is her dancing merrily at bell time. I love the way they dance in circles that weave in and out of each other. Did you notice the way the dance is also progressive? So that each person is like a thread being woven in and out as the circle turns. I love how we see here in this opening scene of the dancing how much Egwene loves to dance. We'll talk a little more about that in another couple of episodes. And of course, 
the best bell time ever rapidly turns into a nightmare when the miller's son, young Tom Thane, is hit by a throwing axe. I love how it felt like the book descriptions of battle. Everything's going fast, then it feels like it slows down, and suddenly it all speeds up again. Once again, we see the power of facial and body language acting. We've seen Egwene give some truly winning smiles. She shed some heartfelt tears. Now her sheer terror and panic are evident. Working alongside Nynaeve. She spends most of the battle with Nynaeve. No matter how horrific the scene starts out, Nynaeve hones in on her protege. Together, they attempt to help others while trying to survive. This situation won't be solved with pressure bandages, nor belt knives. Does that hold either of them back? No. Egwene rises up and fiercely fights against a trollic that's towering over her. We witness the ferocity that foreshadows the person Egwene will grow into. Yet, when Nynaeve, her rock, is dragged away by her braid, Egwene deflates and is lost. Thank the light for Mum. Fortunately, her mum Marin finds her in time. Together, they get out of the middle of the melee. Things are not over, but Moraine and Lan are in the middle of the battle now. This scene teaches us many things about Egwene and her character. We didn't see this attack in the book, but we do see the aftermath, and everything we see in the show matches up with Egwene's character. I'm going to talk a little more about Egwene when we get into the Nynaeve description. All right, next we've got how things went for Perrin, and we know they didn't go well. I didn't notice this particular little detail until I was preparing for this post. The first that we see of Perrin and Layla at the lantern ceremony is this scene where they're watching the lanterns begin to move away from the shore. Layla is holding Perrin's pinky finger again. I really do wonder if we will see this come up in later relationships as it's, it's just a strange little detail. When the dancing begins, it's interesting that it's Egwene that finds Perrin and Layla and drags them both out to dance. They both obviously enjoy dancing too, and there seems to be no ill feelings of any kind from Layla towards Egwene. So I'm still personally trying to figure out exactly what held Layla back from attending Egwene's ceremony in light of how she appears in this scene. The next we see of Perrin is after the Trollocs attack. While Tom falls to the ground and panic sets in, Perrin and Layla quickly think to head to the forge. Layla's ahead and they're both running flat out. Seems as though Perrin's maybe purposefully a little behind her as a protective measure. They let one other villager in and slam the doors closed and put down the bar to lock them. Perrin asks Layla who the Trollocs are. I don't know why he didn't ask what they are, but who. It does, however, give a clue as to how chaotic and confusing the whole situation is. A trollic breaks down the doors and enters the forge. There are at least two villagers in there as well. One must have arrived before Perrin and Layla. Now, I want to highlight the things we saw and learned in the events in the forge. Perrin has a desire to protect those who are weaker than himself or that he perceives that way. Layla also sees herself as capable and immediately moves to get the others out of harm's way. While Perrin yells at her to go, get away, she hides these people and joins in to fight. We know that Perrin is going to feel that he should have protected her at this moment 
let alone with what happens. The second thing that really struck me as beautiful is that Perrin fights with an axe while Layla fights with a hammer. Foreshadowing much? Now let's turn to look at Perrin fighting that last Trolloc. <sighs> I get chills every time I watch that scene. Not only is Perrin a huge strong man, but when he's in battle, he can go into a full berserker mode and lose himself completely. This is thrown in our faces in the very first episode and the facial acting, once again, is incredible. Finally, we see with startling, vivid action that Perrin has good reason to want to be careful around people. I'm a huge book Perrin fan, yet still, even I found the internal monologue on wanting to be careful and not hurt people was maybe laid on a little thick at times. For that one reason, I love how we see this so graphically, so early. We don't need to hear him think any of these things in the show. We get it. Okay, now you're saying, but you didn't talk about fridging. Oh, next blog post, okay? R.I.P. Layla. <sighs> I'm just girding my loins for this post here because this is probably my least favourite topic of discussion out there regarding the show. Still, let's bite the bullet. After all, this is just my not-so-humble opinion. When I grew up, women were still clawing tooth and nail for some pretty basic rights. Okay, we, we could vote before I was born. Let's not get too carried away. And while I don't like to see someone fridged, I believe our experiences help shape us as people. I believe that how we deal with what happens truly shapes us, not what happens. Now, I've thought long and hard about this as it sure caused a lot, like, I mean a lot of discussion. Disclaimer here, I haven't actually read most of these discussions because I'm far more interested in other aspects of the show. I've skimmed them enough to get the vibe of what a lot of people think. Therefore, about the only thing I have to say about this is that while this entire scene and situation was not in the books, the concept of fridging is. Some of you are not going to agree with me that they were fridging or whatever, but that's okay. I'm going to lay out where I've come to on this whole thing. First book fridging. Well, just start by reading the prologue of the very first book, The Eye of the World. While LTT mounts himself soon after, we experience him lamenting this constantly for many books afterwards. His killing of Ilyana haunts him and impacts the PTSD of the LTT character for a very long time. In fact, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't really remember LTT lamenting particularly about having destroyed the world. It was purely the death of Ilyana at his hands that drives his torment forwards. Second book, Fridging. Now we have Tom's story in The Great Hunt. We're only the second book into the series. And I've never really heard fans screaming on how wrong the death of Dina was. Come on now, that was classic fridging. Maybe fans have gone off about that for a long time. I've only been in the fandom. Let's, let's remember that for the last couple of years. But I don't hear that getting yelled about the way I've heard Perrin and Layla. And the third book, Fridging. 
This last one is the best one to me. Again, I don't hear fans yelling, you fridged her, RJ. Maybe they do and I've just never heard it. Okay, so do you remember Leia? I mean, come on. Layla is in the books, but a different arc. Leia sounds similar and already look at how killing Layla has allowed Ela to talk directly to Perrin's heart about his use of the axe. In The Dragon Reborn, so now we're into book three, a Tuatha Um woman comes up the mountain looking for Moraine. Min tells Perrin that she's going to die. Perrin struggles terribly with this. He knows Min says all her viewings come true. Our beautifully sensitive Perrin can't help himself anyway. He does all he can to save her, all he can to prevent her death. But she dies anyway, and it really impacts him. Even before she dies, he goes deep into his rabbit hole of not wanting to hurt anyone. Like, I could go on and on about the connections to Perrin, the books, and the brilliance in choices the show made. Yes, even in the decision to include Layla as his wife, rather than someone he would have chosen to marry. Something I love about writing this blog is that I get to start every post with a clear idea of what I want to say. Then I spend a couple of hours on each post. I think of this or that. Next thing, I get into the amazing online resources. I read entries in the companion and passages from the books and bam, I'm in my own little rabbit hole and having the best time in the world. Now that I'm recording, I'll add on to that, that then when I start reading what I've written out loud to record, my brain sparks off in all kinds of other little ways and I end up going back and editing the post and adding more bits in or elaborating on bits because that's just how my brain does shit. Brown Arja to the 100% thousand max. All right, I'll wrap up to my conclusion. I stand up in a vocal way for women, but I do feel this works better as a story plot than all the internal dialogue about how he fears hurting people. The show combines two book situations together and demonstrates one of Perrin's important character traits. We showed it in a way that will stick firmly in our memory, that's for sure. New viewers will understand many things about him easily for the rest of the show. In the books, when Perrin goes berserk for the first time, he kills two white cloaks. That's never considered fridging, by the way. I find that interesting. But they focus on him as a murderer and they pretty much ignore Egwene. So instead, we see that same behavior in battle here, except that he kills the one he loves. Egwene, on the other hand, is the focus of the White Cloaks as Valda hunts Aes Sedai. We can be sure Valda is not yet finished with either Perrin nor Egwene, and this will allow a good story arc to continue to develop if things head in that direction. We may also get a meaningful depth to his relationship with Fael and how that both begins and develops. Maybe people will even like that relationship better. <laughs> That's going to be interesting to see. And we get one final holding of the pinky finger to remember her by. Indeed, R.I.P. Layla. And on to Nynaeve. Now, I presume the Latin Nynaeve places in the water is for her parents. We don't really learn if you put a Latin in for each person you're remembering or if each person places a lantern in the water for any number of people and I'm kind of guessing the latter is correct. I, I figure this because Matt felt a strong need to buy a lantern for each of his sisters 
and for himself. He didn't feel a need to get one for his parents. Or, or did you see them with lanterns of their own? <sighs> Every time I think I've watched it minutely, maybe I've missed shitloads of things for all I know. The main point really is that Nynaeve observes this ritual and she has people to grieve. Now, the best bit. Did you see it? Did you? As she stands up and walks away from the water, she very deliberately smooths her skirts. If you missed it, I didn't realise it till I was taking screenshots for these posts and then I rolled about laughing at how delicious that was. Yep, when Nynaeve is stressed, she smooths her skirts. When the Trollocs attack, it's no surprise when we see Nynaeve choosing to save Egwene first in the melee. Knowing her nature, I'm sure she calculates that she's going to need a lot of help healing people when this ends. Nynaeve is nothing short of a badass. Egwene looks up to Nynaeve, so she naturally asks what's going on and what these creatures are. See, this is where I noticed. She asks, what are they, rather than the who are they, like parent. In typical fashion, <laughs> if you don't know the answer, say nothing. Instead of simply running and hiding, Nynaeve immediately begins trying to save her people. Oh, we get to see so much of her true nature in seconds. She's concerned for her people and their pain. I'm certain she knows that this old man is dying, yet she calmly reassures him. First day, 101. The scene with Nynaeve and Egwene fighting a Trolloc still gives me so many chills. This is one of the Trollocs that runs on all four legs that comes at them. And when it stands, it seems to actually grow in size. Oh, so creepy. The Trolloc roars and Nynaeve screams. Her face and mouth are amazing. I would be terrified if she faced me. All she has is her belt knife and that fits with her facing Trollocs in the books perfectly. Notice she tries to stand between Egwene and the Trollocs, yet Egwene proves her mettle and screams too and attacks the Trolloc with a lump of wood. Now you might remember in the Eye of the World after fleeing Shadow Logov, Perrin finds Egwene across the other side of the river. When he approaches her, she has a tree branch in her hand and is ready to fight with it. She was hiding from Trollocs, of course, so this really stood out to me in this scene. Once again, the show gives us exactly what we learn about our characters from the books. In the fight with the Trollocs on the Camelon Road after fleeing Bearlon, RJ gives us this description of Nynaeve and Egwene fighting together. With frantic urgency, teeth bared almost as fiercely as the Trollocs, belt knives in hand. There you go, nailed it. It's obvious they had no hope of killing this Trolloc. And just in the nick of time, they can see the weaves as fire and air whip around the trolley, literally tearing it in half. Do you think Egwene remembers this weave when we get her to the show version of The Last Battle? You might remember that she's described as ripping trollocs apart in droves. She's going to be so awesomely overpowered by then. But the point is, this episode already sets up a huge array of foreshadowing that future seasons will be able to draw on. The last we see of Nynaeve is a Trolloc dragging her away by her braid. Oh, wonderful cliffhanger for new viewers. Even for us, it was a huge shock. It was no accident 
she's dragged off that way. In the shadow rising, do you remember Bodhi Cawthon is hauled up into the air by her braid, Briar Trollic. However, she opens her mouth wide in a scream and sinks her wood axe into its shoulder while the other women attack it too, freeing her. Nynaeve has no help and is dragged away. I wonder if that was part of the inspiration for this scene. Whatever the origin, the scene has tremendous visual and visceral impact. She does get dragged by her braid in A Crown of Swords. Of course, that was in an attempt to rescue her. Lan drags her from the river by her braid. I feel we get a few lovely pieces of foreshadowing in episode one alone around Nynaeve. Her blockage, rivers and braids. How many of them did you notice? Moraine and Lan. They keep themselves apart from the lantern ceremony and that's fitting, but Moraine is always watching. She's on the other side of the water to Egwene. We saw Egwene and Nynaeve standing on a bridge earlier listening to the wind, so we can presume that bridge is at least reasonably close to the village. Maybe Moraine's doing a little scouting as well, or else she's simply waiting for Lan to return from his scouting. It feels like it takes them a long time to get from there back to the village, but jumping from scene to scene so fast can make it hard to nail the timestamps exactly. And I'm a little unsure of the distance that they are from the village. Maybe someone's mapped that out. It's obvious, however, that the dancing and festivities are underway before the conversation that they have beside the water in the woods. The mystery of who is the Dragon Reborn. We already know that one of the glaring differences between season one and the book is the mystery they're creating around the identity of the Dragon Reborn. This adds a little more urgency to the situation. Moraine thought that she had a little more time to work this out. She may have hoped it was Egwene as taking her back to the White Tower to become an Aes Sedai would have been an easy out of the village. Now, there is no time. I like the way Moraine's put in a quandary and obviously doesn't know everything. Although I love the almost slapstick type humour when they leave in the books, this gave more urgency to them all leaving. Remember the scene in the stables? Perrin fails at checking the loft. Tom does his big entrance from above after Egwene reveals how bad everyone is sneaking about. And it reads so well. I think these actors could have even pulled it off, but the show went for another hook for the viewers, solve the mystery. Lan confirms that dozens of Trollocs are out there and are fade. In the books, Lan and Moraine sense the Trollocs approaching just moments before the attack starts. They were inside the inn. Either they were asleep and woke, or I suspect at least Lan may have been awake. Regardless, this is similar because just before the attack, Moraine and Lan realise the threat and come rushing to the aid of the village. Their battle abilities. While we did not see this battle or attack um, in the books, we did see the Camelon Road battle when the Trollocs catch up to the group. I think the show made a great choice in this regard. I've been reading that scene again a few times and have listened to several podcasters as they discuss it. If you want to know who I follow and draw a lot of my great inspiration and pondering from, hop over to the Cards of Time website and check the page of links I've got to all my favourite content creators. But go back to the book and read it again. Even if you think you remember it, it's great to refresh your own memory. On the Camelon Road, Moraine uses a few combinations of elements in the battle to create different weapons. Firstly, she uses fire and air. 
quoting from the book, flame enveloped Trollocs, then burst with a roar that left misshapen forms unmoving on the ground. The descriptions of Nynaeve and Egwene hit the mark here too. And I talked about that a little bit more in depth just earlier when I was looking at Nynaeve's um, and Egwene's part in the battle. Now, in that same battle on the Camelin Road, we read of Land's superb skills as well. It says, Above the roar and howl crashed the tolling of the water sword against the madrals. The air fled, blew around them, fled again, again. Even as I read this scene, the writing is just like the show battle, except for he was not fighting a madral, he was fighting the Trollocs. It's mayhem, and we jump from one perspective to another with only seconds for each. As they prepare to flee, Moraine uses the Angriel to power up. Now she uses earth as a weapon. Very differently, but I'll talk more about that a little bit um, further on. Moraine causes the earth to quiver and the effect ripples out. Oh, great foreshadowing of the Jumides Wells battle. This topples all the Trolloc armies and Moraine follows it with more fires on an epic level. She's exhausted and spent. And we read, Abruptly, Moraine wavered and would have fallen had Lan not leapt from his horse to catch her. So now if we look at the village attack we saw on screen. And in the book again, we don't see this attack scene, but we hear several different narrators as they give accounts of the events. Master Alvir says, Why? She called ball lightning out of a clear night sky, sent it darting straight at the Trollocs. You've seen trees shattered by it. The Trollocs stood it no better. He then goes on to say, and Master Lan was a whirlwind with that sword of his. His sword? The man himself is a weapon and in 10 places at once, or so it seemed. I just love how accurately that description sums up the beginning of their fighting together on screen. The way I'm reading it is that this passage was used to give us the beginning of the battle. Then they took the Camelin Road scene to flesh it out even more. We only get this one battle with the Trollocs until the end of the season. So it makes perfect sense to me to combine the best bits and create one amazing scene in episode one to really bring new viewers along with awe. Now, we know that she doesn't have her staff. <sighs> so glad about that. And she's carrying a Saar Ungriel that is made for a male channeler. Rather than confuse us with too many artifacts, we just get the ability of Moraine. This is going to be important for viewers as they learn about the difference in power levels of individuals. There is no doubt that Moraine is one high level, powerful Aes Sedai. It also made me think of the scene in The Shadow Rising when Rand uses Kalendor to create that huge mass that sends bolts of lightning shooting everywhere, killing only Trollocs. Is this scene a foreshadowing of this too? Honestly, every time I break things down to moment by moment, I see how well this show embodies the entire story. The amount of thought that has gone into weaving layers and layers of aspects into every scene is astounding. Another difference too is Moraine being wounded by the Trolloc throwing knife. I love this change because we hear in the book over and over that no matter how powerful a channeler is, one arrow can take them out. And so, right here at the beginning, we watch her awesome power. But a throwing knife is inches from killing her outright. As we move into the next part when more Trollocs arrive, 
we move in the Camelon Road tactics. Instead of the rolling waves of earth, Moraine pulls the inner part brick by earthen brick and throws it at the trolleys for a huge finale. The strain is obviously huge, and as she gracefully wavers and begins to fall, Lan races to her aid. He not only lowers her to the ground, but bodily shields her from the dust and rubble flying out from the collapsing inn. <laughs> Delicious! One last difference is that we haven't yet seen the death of a Madral and the impact on the Trolloc it's linked to. I'm happy that this is going to be a new revelation in season two and it will be like moving to level two. Let's jump into Matt's perspective now. I love seeing this gentle side of Matt with his sisters. On the one hand, he is a gambler and we're not sure just what he gets up to. On the other hand, he's a loyal brother. Well, it's more than being loyal, isn't it? I mean, he truly cares about the mental health of his sisters as well as their physical needs. Everything goes to pieces as the Trollocs attack. Like most villagers, Matt heads to a building he thinks will be safe. He races inside, slams the door and looks around. And the moment he sees his parents, he knows that they don't have the girls sobbing in their arms. The way he roars, where are the girls, made the hair on my arms stand up. I love how we see the side of Matt we know so well from the books. I'm thinking when the Trolloc attack starts first, his first thought is probably something like, nope, I'm no bloody hero, I'm out of here. And with that thought, he runs to shelter. Just think about some of the battle scenes we know so well where Matt is going to get out of there. Something always happens that makes him think, oh, well, I'll, I just have to fix this one thing. Without thinking it through, he simply glares at his useless parents, turns and races out into the thick of the battle for the girls. RJ had an amazing battle riding skill. Instead of just describing things like he lifted his sword and struck through the heart with all his might or some such thing, he made you feel the experiences. I feel this style of riding depicted on screen when Matt starts running frantically searching for the girls. I'm not always a fan of the shaky cam but in these battle scenes, it works for me. Matt runs, stumbles, and even trips right over a trolley mid-entrail snack on a poor villager. What a way to shout at the viewer, hey, trolleys eat people. Imagine the girls have hidden in a safe spot, but they can see Matt heading their way and scream for him to get them. Then we get one of the hundreds of beautiful Easter eggs that are just for us. We find the clue to this line in the shadow rising. Perrin has returned to Eamon's field and he's organizing the village for the Trolloc attack. Day's Conger is there and I'll reference this again in another post soon. Anyway, she says to Perrin, if the Trollocs break through anywhere, you men are gonna be busy so we will take the children out. The elder ones know what to do and they've all played hide and seek in the woods just to keep them safe until they can come out. Matt's certainly one of the older children, well, way older, and he takes girls to the big oak in the woods where they play at hide and seek. Perfection and yes, delicious. I was heartbroken for Matt when he brings the girls back the next morning. They see their mum, she jumps up and immediately races to them with her arms outstretched. No thanks to Matt, not even eye contact from Natty. She doesn't even care that he's also safe. Just, oh thank the light. Um, excuse me? 
Oh, thank you, Matt. You saved them. And what about, and I'm so glad you're safe too. Hmm. The look between Matt and Abel is another beautiful example of the facial acting we get in the show. No words needed. I truly feel the quality of the facial acting reflects the quality of the internal dialogues we get in the books. With Pudden Fane, we only see mere seconds of glimpses of him. From celebratory dancing to wild chaotic terror, he watches from the shadows. In the books, Fane was more outspoken and a bringer of news. It certainly gave readers a false trail for some chapters at least. Actually, on first read, I think a lot of us miss that there was anything amiss in the early chapters. In the show, Fane quietly, but openly enough, rips Matt off. We realise quickly that they've done these deals before. He's obviously disdainful towards Matt and his circumstances. Of course, this could be because he knows all is going to go to shit very quickly and he just doesn't care. But Matt doesn't seem surprised at his treatment, so maybe he has always been a tad shady. Once the Trollocs attack and the true chaos begin, Fane chuckles and quietly slips out the back. I literally gasped at this, even though I knew he'd set the whole thing up. Completely fits the character we know and love to hate. High on the quarry road overlooking the village, as the attack begins, did you notice we see the Fade who brought the Trollocs here watching? I love this so much. We do get a Fade on the quarry road. See? But what's really gorgeous is that in the book, Rand is the only one out of him and Tam who sees the Fade on the quarry road. This time in the show, we're the only ones who see the Fade on the quarry road. <laughs> it's really very clever. And finally, the last of the attack night scenes that I want to go over a perspective from is Daisy Conga. I can't talk about this incredible scene without finishing on the high note of her ferocity. In the book, the beautiful moment of heroic ferocity belongs to Alspeth Luhan. She's married to the blacksmith and parents the apprentice. She manages a classic trollic kill with a frying pan. Of course, we didn't get the Luhans at all in the show, so the swap out is quite perfect. I honestly love that we still got a similar scene to shriek over. And not only that, it is a scene from the books. In The Shadow Rising, we read, He wrenched the blade free in time to see Daisy Conga's pitchfork tines take a goat snouted trollic in the throat. It goes on further to say, All up and down the line, as far as Perrin could see, the women were there. Okay, the book describes the line and in the show they form a beautiful visual of a circle. But that's exactly the kind of visual that works perfectly in this medium. And I just love the line Daisy gets to shout, You want a real feast? Come and get some of this. Just compare that to her declaring it a night off for Egwene. Fun-loving, ale-swigging, laughing Daisy transforms into a protector of the village. I hope we see her as wisdom. It is more than fair to say, don't mess with Daisy Conga. Finally, the battle's over and it's the next morning and we return to a scene that is similar to the book account. The cinematography is stunning because they actually built this town and burned it down. I really feel this helps the acting as well as the visuals. The smell of smoke is literally in their nostrils and the set they've been working with for months is destroyed around them. Remember, these actors were all there during the destruction of their set too. I mean, that tree, oh, that totally gutted me. 
Matt is the first to appear. He brings the girls back from the woods and no sooner does Natty take them, but Perrin walks out of the forge. How wrenching is the sight of Perrin carrying Layla's body? Regardless of what you think of the decision to bring her into the show instead of the Luhans, the fast switch from Matt with his sisters alive and safe to Perrin with her body limp in his arms is a jolt. Once again, the nature of the internal match shines as he immediately reacts to seeing this. He goes directly to his friend and places a hand on his shoulder. Understanding and solidarity. In the books, when Perrin finds out he lost his entire family, he doesn't have Matt or Rand with him. I'm interested to just note this now because we'll talk more about this in later episodes, the way Perrin internalises what has happened. Fael often brought this up and would try to get him to express his grief at the death of his entire family. Now Rand comes walking into town. He's obviously dazed by his own traumas. I loved how RJ brought us into town inside Rand's head. He pushes himself with the belief that if he can just get into town, all will be okay. He doesn't even consider, not even for a moment, that there could have been Trollocs here. The show visuals of Rand's face said all the same things. Even though he had the help of Bella, his trauma is no less deep. Because Tom and Nynaeve are not there, the scene is quite simple, getting Rand from arriving to Moraine. I do feel that after the intense action of the battle and the fact we've literally only got minutes left, this is a good choice. Moraine is already healing those she can. It's logical she gives field triage and treatment. Uses of the One Power. Well, I love that we saw five separate uses for the One Power in this first episode alone. We learned so much by seeing these events. Firstly, you can sever somebody else who can channel from the One Power. Simple tasks like warming bath water are possible. You can eavesdrop on people from quite a distance. This power is a mighty weapon and the one power is also a powerful healing force. Finally, we get to the scene that embodies the name of episode one, Leave Takings. Rand actually turns around and challenges Moraine. So despite that Moraine heals Tam, it's suddenly all just too much for Rand. In the book, he was a little more desperate and bargained with her, but here he confronts her. I know that feeling of being so tense that on its release, there's a kind of whiplash. I hadn't realized how often he challenged her in the early books until writing this. Most of my memories of his attitude are linked to things he went through, but Rand was cautious from the start, especially with the warning Tam had given him. In the books, we had all the delicious sneaking about. The three boys were instructed not to tell anyone they were leaving. Some of the scenes are quite comical, especially in the stables. I feel that we need to keep the last minutes moving. It would have become terribly complicated to sneak around and take time to leave. Since the show had already established that Egwene was a possibility, Moraine can address her publicly with the others. I know, we were hoping for the classic weep for Manetheran speech, but it's okay, we get it, just in a different order. Moraine splaining. Moraine instead gives us a quick recap of Guitarist foretelling. Now the white eyes, I believe, came from their original intention to make that scene of the foretelling a cold open. White eyes on a seer are a great visual fantasy trope. The scene was ditched, but for some reason, those white eyes part of it was left in the narrative. 
Does it really matter? Well, just think for a moment. Does it change one dot of the full story scope of the Wheel of Time? Nope, not even half a dot. Okay, I can just shrug and move on. Her closing monologue to the town really embodies nicely the end of the eye of the world. Moraine says, the prophecies will be fulfilled. The dragon is reborn. Oh, instead of those words being the end, we get a little comic relief in a classic line from Matt. Honestly, this statement is Matt to the core. You've fully lost your mind. We gots to go. I love the way the show mixes showing and telling in a balanced way. As soon as Moraine finishes her explanation, our attention moves up to the mountain. Glowing torchlights are moving down towards the town. Land estimates immediately and proclaims there are at least 300 Trollocs. Did you notice how this episode ends with a question? How did they get here so fast? Were you yelling the answer on the first watch? <laughs> I admit that I was actually pretty vocal all through every episode. Without further ado, Moraine and Lan scoop the kids up and they flee. Personally, I would prefer to see a little more resistance and just a little more time getting them away from their home and families. Maybe it's the last firm line that Moraine utters. There's no time. We leave now. I also love the way episode one ends with the opening lines of the first book. What a lovely wrapping, monologuing this over, them writing out in haste. Before the show came out, there were some great fan discussions on how the opening credits would look. A popular theory, and I quite liked this one, was to have a wind rising and blowing over the landscape for that episode. It was very book oriented, in a lovely way. But I think we all knew that for new viewers, it would seem too much like an attempt to echo Game of Thrones with their maps. I felt so satisfied at the end of this episode because we got those lines and we got the feeling of the wind and we came around in a full circle. The wheel of time turns and ages come and pass, leaving memories that become legend. Legend fades to myth and even myth is long forgotten when the age that gave it birth comes again. In one age, called the Third Age by some, a wind rose in the mountains of mist. The wind was not the beginning. There are neither beginnings nor endings to the turning of the wheel of time, but it was a beginning. And in truth, the TV show adaptation of The Wheel of Time is a beginning. While I'm having the most ridiculous amount of fun creating all of this content, it has taken me several months simply to review episode one. So no matter how long it does end up or not taking for season two to come out, I have no doubt I won't even be finished reviewing season one whenever that happens, but that's okay. If you would like to see more of what I'm doing and you haven't been there, head over to cardsoftime.net.au. Don't forget the .au because yes, I am in the Madlands and so there's that little tiny bit that goes on to the end of the address. I'm on most places of social media now um, as at Koala Sedai. I am going to turn this into a podcast. So by the time you're listening to it, maybe I've done that and you're already listening to it through podcasting. I'm just trying to make the content I'm creating available 
in as many different ways as possible because I know that we all like to consume just a little bit differently. So I hope you've enjoyed it all. Please do join in with me in any way, whether you talk to me on Twitter, Facebook, Discords, or register on the Cards of Time website and make comments on particular episodes there. However you do it, I'd love to talk more about the Wheel of Time. It is really my favourite escape from this mad world we live in.